very last verse in Genesis chapter 10. It said, these are the families of the sons of Noah according to their genealogies by their nations. Now what they've just done in chapter 10 is he's listed all the uh, descendants of, or not all of them, but the sons of Japheth, the sons of Shem, the sons of Ham. And he says, and out of these, the nations were separated on the earth after the flood. So that kind of sets you where we are. Now we move on into uh, chapter 11. It says, now the whole earth used the same language in the same words. And it came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and they settled there. And they said to one another, come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and they used tar for mortar. And they said, come, let us build for ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into heaven. And let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we'll be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And the Lord said, behold, they are one people and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do. And now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel. Now, Babel there is confusion. And of course, we get the word like babbling. Uh, but remember, let's uh, look back in chapter 10. I wanted to show you that verse 10 again, that we know that Nimrod was the one that was involved in this because it says right here, in uh, verse 10, that the beginning of his kingdom was Babel, or, I, I didn't tell y'all a minute ago, or what's the other word for that? Confusion? Yeah, but I mean Babel. Babylon. Babylon. Okay. That's, that's where we get all that. Babylon. And isn't it interesting that the name is confusion? You know, I mean, when when in, when you depth of the and in fact, some some versions of the Bible in in I'm back in Genesis chapter eleven now in verse nine, some of them say Babylon right there. Does anybody have that? It says Babylonia. The land of Babylon. Babylonia. What is yours, Phil? Babylon. <clears throat> it says Babylon. Yeah. Okay. Babylon. <clears throat> because there, the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there, the Lord scattered them all over the face of the earth. And so now, what happens, what we're, what we're getting now is another retelling of the genealogy of Shem. Uh, we could go into the Tower of, of, of Babel, uh, but, I mean, I think we've heard that, that story before, and it, it's, it's, it's pretty fascinating. I was reading some stuff today, and Kurt and I were kind of talking about it, too, that some ling you say linguists some linguists the language experts say that they believe that all language all languages can be traced back you know to one language uh, that they have traces of, of origins in uh, now I, I, I'm no expert so I can't tell you that but it was just an interesting thought you know because I mean it did evidently you know, right here. So, <laughs> you know, but, but at any rate, it's, it's pretty fascinating. Uh, and it is, and it's also fascinating that they use some of these same words. Uh, I've seen some of the software that translates languages on online and stuff like that. One of them is called uh, something about Babel. And you think about it, we've got online software that actually reverses time and we go all the way back to the Tower of Babel one language because now you can say anything in a language and it'll just be your, your phone will do it. You can get an app that'll do it. You'll say, uh, where's a glass of water? What language? German. There. And you hold it up to the guy. Oh, and so the German, yeah. You know, so think about it. So now what well, is cool, except in the other sense, he said, now, uh, let's scatter them because they know too much. You know, so now it's almost like, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not, it's just interesting thoughts. That's all I'm saying, you know, because it is cool. You put them in different parts of the earth. 
yeah. with their own language. And he sent them, I mean, spread them out. And now they were no longer, hey, I, hey, listen, listen to this. This is, this is free. This is a free little. There's this thing called uh, online now called crowdsourcing. Have you ever heard of it? Has anybody ever heard of it? Uh, it's been around, and, and there's been people that have studied uh, getting crowds to work on stuff. And but here's what's happening: there was this there was this guy that uh, lived in a high-rise building, apartment building. Uh, I mean, regular family or anything. It wasn't a, a richy building, but just they lived in upper story of a building in in one of the cities up on the east coast. And he used to love to sit in the window as a kid and watch the patterns of um, people walking on the sidewalks and going through intersections. You see how they, they all come up, traffic lights stop, here's the traffic's going this way, and then you'd see everybody cross, and then you'd see some people would cross through the middle of the intersection, others would cross right, to, and he'd just watch all that and say, man, that's what, well, he somehow always got interested in how crowds move and how they work. Started as a kid, and he ends up getting a doctorate and of course more studies than just watching a crowd but how crowds behave and all this kind of stuff well um this other thing hello glad you're here um and there was a man that was having some real difficulties uh getting some problems solved through their computer programs that they had and they, they weren't putting together solutions. I mean, the software that they were using uh, just could not solve some of these problems. And he heard about this guy that was really into using crowds to do things. And so he called that guy and collaborated with him. And they decided that if they could get enough people working on a project, that they could come up with solutions that software would take years. And you think, in your head, you think, well, software can do anything better than we can do it. But what they did was they decided they could make a game out of it online. And then they could enlist anybody in the world to go online and collaborate and build on somebody would make a suggestion, somebody else would say, no, that won't work. And somebody would say, yes, it would if you did this. No, it won't if you add that. No, but if you take away this, it would work. <coughs> or you can multiply it 10 times over here. And what they found that within hours, they were solving problems that was taking computers months. Oh, wow. Whoa. It's bizarre. And, you're, and, and so I, I go back to thinking what man with their common language and their common ability and pull together uh, imagine. It's like the computer is the one world language. It kind of. And now they, they, the thing was on the computer, the computer does not care if you're eight years old and you know how to do quantum physics. You know, you know what I'm saying? But I might not go hire an eight-year-old in my company to help solve some solution. But online, it was, it was people from five and six years old to people in their 90s online that had, had experience, and they were all building off each other. This person over here didn't know how to do this part of the problem, but he knew how to do this part of the problem. And this person knew how to do this part of the problem, and somebody else knew how to connect the two together. You, you know what I mean? It was just un... And it, and it grew exponentially. You know what I mean by that? It didn't just grow like a little bit at a time and grow. No, it began to multiply. Like all the multi-level marketing guys tell you, well, if you'll just buy my product. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and it will work. It will it work. Really if you're the guy that gets everybody in. <laughs> but if you're like me, I'm the guy that, you know, I'm trying to convince everybody and you're always going, no, I don't think I want to do that, Bruce. Uh, please get in. If I can get three people to get in, if I can get three people in a day, I can retire at the end of the month. <laughs> if enough people will get in. But anyway, that's uh, just interesting thoughts on the Tower of Babel. And 
Uh, oh, and by the way, I did, I had some uh, uh, kind of fake, fake pictures online uh, to, to show. And I, I think that's probably Lori and them. Hey, Lori and kids. Um, but in Ur, Ur of the Chaldees, which is, Ur is there in Iraq. E-R-R or E-R? You are. Oh, you are. You are. Ur, Ur. Actually, they say it probably more Ur, Ur. Uh, they actually have, uh, they call them ziggurats or, or something like that, but it's where they build these structures with steps. They're really wide platforms and they build them up and then they. Ziggurats. So, huh? It's supposed to be a Z. Yeah, ziggurats. Ziggurats, yeah. Ziggurat, something, something like that. And they actually had remains uh, of some places like that which was not that far away from where this probably was, uh, something very similar, where they build these levels and then they'll flatten that out with dirt and, and they've got stone around the outside and then they'll build another one on top of that, a you know, smaller one. And then they keep building them, you know, going up. But they, it, it was just interesting to see that in an old book uh, that I had looked at yesterday. Uh, saw that they actually had a, a real picture of one. It wasn't a drawing, yeah, you know. I think mankind is still trying to make a name for themselves because we have those in South America with all those different tribes that were yes, yes. there. And, uh, Back in the, like the Aztecs. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, some of that was very all similar. That. Yeah, They're looking. They all built in that pyramid. Yeah, okay. yeah. Egyptians. Always. Uh, reaching to the heavens. Yeah. Like and, 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 and how did say I heard somebody comment one time that the space program is the exact same thing. Man trying to reach into the heavens. Mm -hmm. Well, I hadn't thought about it quite like that, but you know, depends on what our motives are. You know, it. I mean, that that would be the deciding factor, wouldn't it? Uh, but this is what um, at this point, regardless, you know, mm -hmm. everybody was scattered. So now mankind is scattered, and they've got different languages. And so now they, and I even read uh, one place where somebody had suggested that even genetics were, were changed because when you think about it, they all went in a certain area and they all spoke the same language. It would almost, I could, I could understand it if it did happen uh, genetically, if something altered and that they all became a people, you know what I mean? Uh, uh, but, but regardless, I don't know. But, um, well, let's move on down, and I, I want to skip now. And uh, anybody got any other thoughts or anything? Skip down to verse 24. Then this is uh, moving on down now. Whose whose bloodline are we in right now? Shem. Shem. Just get a hold of that. Shem. Can we say it together? Shem. Yeah. Say, it, say it like you mean it. Shem. Okay. <laughs> Hey, there's some good names in here to say. We need to try to say these names. No. Wait a minute. Shem's, wait a minute. There it is. Go back up to verse 10. I want everybody to say this one. <laughs> Shem was 100 years old and became the father of Arpachshad. 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 So that's the one you don't hear quoted very often. But anyway, all right, move on down. And then there's one I always remember in verse 18. In verse 18, we've got uh, Peleg, Peleg, Peleg. I always, I always think of a pirate when, when I'm reading that. Peg, oh, I know what it is, Pegleg. I, I never have put it together. I'm thinking, why do I always think of pirate? This is because of Pegleg. But it's Peleg or Peleg, Peleg. Okay, so uh, now he was a youngster. Look at that. Peleg lived 30 years and became the father of Ru. And usually they're like, well, they you know. Well, they said he lived 209 years after that. Which one? Peleg. Oh, he did? Yeah. Oh, yeah. He lived 209 years after that. They lived two or three hundred more years after that. Oh, yeah, yeah. But look down to verse 24. Is this where we're going to? This is a biggie. Nahor lived 29 years. He was a youngie too. And he became the father of Terah. Who's Terah? Abraham's father. Abraham's father. Ooh, okay. Now we're getting we're getting somewhere. 
So Terah and Nahor lived 119, wait a minute, became the father of Terah. And Nahor, his father, lived 119 years after he became the father of Terah, and he had other sons and daughters. Now, hey, y'all don't get hung up on this. I'm, I'm not going to focus on all, but just wanted to let you see it. 26. This is uh, Genesis 11, 26. And Terah lived 70 years and became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran. Now there's two Nahor's now. Yeah, now there's a Nahor named, probably named after Grandpa. Yeah. Looks like. But there's a lot of double names. But um, now these, uh, now 27, let me read that. These are the record of the generations of Terah. Terah became the father of Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot. Have y'all heard of Lot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was Abraham's nephew, or Abram's nephew this time. I got an observation. Yes. None of these, there's hardly anybody in the Bible that has a surname. Right. Except for Jesus Christ. Well, because uh, a lot of what the Hebrews eventually did, they always uh, they always talked about their father, or generally. So they would say, uh, Simon Bar Jonah, Bar son of. Oh, okay. So it's a Simon son of Jonah. That's that's why it's so fascinating in the New Testament. Uh, Nazareth, y'all know y'all remember what Nazareth means? Thorns. Uh. -uh. Well, there's so many. You know what? There are so many things that are so fascinating when you see it. You don't know what Bethlehem means? Place of the dead? No. You're just guessing. I know. <laughs> I'm having fun with it, though. Uh, Bethlehem means bread. Oh, wow. And Jesus was born in Bethlehem. He says, I'm the true bread that came. I'm the true manna. He said, I'm the bread of life. Isn't that wild? Now, Nazareth means branch. So get a hold of this. In Jeremiah and in two or three other chapters, big, big prophecies are that, that God said through the prophet that uh, he will be uh, the branch, the right, a righteous branch will come. I mean, he, he'll be the one. And it keeps talking about the Messiah will be the righteous branch of Israel. He'll be the branch. He'll be the one. And it uses that several different places and it uses it in several different ways. Now, so Jesus born in Bethlehem, bread. But then where does he grow up? Nazareth. So what do they call him? A stick of bread? I don't know. <laughs> they call him Jesus of Nazareth. Of Nazareth. Okay, to us, it doesn't mean anything. It just means Jesus of Nazareth. To them, it meant Jesus, the branch. And the righteous people and the Pharisees hated it. Because, okay, Jesus was a hugely common name. So they may have said, you know, Jesus of, of whatever, of, I can't even think of another city. Huh? Uh, <laughs> yeah, of Alto, Jesus of Tyler. And then they'd say, well, Jesus, who are you talking about? <laughs> Jesus, the branch. So they, they were almost forced to use the prophetic terminology for Jesus when they didn't want to at all because mm -hmm. they didn't want to accept him as the Messiah. Right. Oh. So it's just pretty bizarre. And you go back and go, this is just crazy. You know what I mean? Just those little tidbits. Did you remember me talk, uh, us talking about that? Yes. Yeah, it's just it's just wild. So he was called, we, we, and of course, the way we interpret it, we lose the meaning. You know, as we just say, well, Jesus of Nazareth. But when they're saying it, it's Jesus the branch. Mm. I know Paul, I'm sure. Okay, Saul beforehand. I know he probably wouldn't probably would refuse to say it literally because i mean that's he all he wanted to do is persecute those that were believers you know he just thought that was the worst thing on the planet but anyway i'm, I'm sidetracking here we go uh genesis 11 we're down at 27 um Terah became the father of abram 
Nahor and Haran, and Haran became the father of Lot, who, if you'll remember later, is, is Abram's nephew. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his birth in Ur of the Chaldeans. You've heard of Ur, right? Uh, we talk about that a lot, and we're going to, we'll talk some more. 29. Abram and Nahor took wives for themselves. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai, and the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and Iscah, I guess is how you say that one. Now, Sarah was barren, and she had no child. Now, why would it just say that? Because it's very important. She didn't have any children. And then also, if you want to hold your spot and look over to Genesis 20, uh, verse 12. This is that verse that I just wanted to, I just wanted to point it out to you because, um, I mean, I, I couldn't find this forever. I, didn't, I don't know what I was looking for. I'm trying to, like, wait. This is what I was telling you about Sarah. Genesis 20, 12, it says, this is uh, Abraham talking to um, the king Abimelech. And he said, King Abimelech says, why did you tell me she was your sister? You deceived me. And Abraham says, well, besides, she actually is my sister, the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. And she became my wife. So when we have, uh, you'll, you'll see if, if we, I don't know if we'll get to it today, but when Abraham uh, was fearful and he had said, uh, tell them you're my sister, it was a half truth. It, 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 he, he didn't say, yeah. he didn't say she's not my wife, but he said, he didn't say the whole truth. You know, that she is my wife and she's my half sister. But he did it twice. Yeah, and he did it twice. Uh, but uh, let's go on in verse 31. Uh, now, huh? Chapter 11. Oh, excuse me. Yes, in, in chapter 11. I just, I just wanted to show you that. Probably should have shown you later, but it was on my mind. So I thought we would do it. <laughs> 31. Terah took Abram, his son, and Lot, the son of Haran, his grandson, and Sarai, his daughter-in-law, his son, Abram's wife, and they went out together from Ur of the Chaldeans in order to enter the land of Canaan. And they went as far as Haran and settled there. And then it says the days of Terah were 205 years and Terah died in Haran. So they left Ur of the Chaldees, which is right over there, close to the Persian Gulf is where it's at. And they went actually kind of north um, and actually toward the northern part of Iraq today. Um, and then that's where Haran was. And then they came from, well, when his father died, then they came down south toward Canaan, which was in, in where Israel is. And so verse 12, chapter 12. So now we're in Genesis 12. And this is also an interesting statement that you, uh, it, at times it doesn't make any sense. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, does anybody else have anything in their Bible? 12, verse 1. The Lord said to Abram. Anybody got anything else? Amplified says the same thing. Okay. Um, really, from the Greek, it's the idea is the Lord had said to Abram. He'd already said it. Because it looks like, look back up at 31. It looks like Terah took Abram, his son. But what scripture has told us is that the Lord spoke to Abram, not to his father, and told him to leave where they lived. And I think the idea is that Terah just went along. It would have been like humiliating that you would think your son, oh, I didn't even tell you all this part, but that Ur of the Chaldees was a huge uh, moon and star worshiping city. You didn't live there unless you were worshiping the moon and the stars. So, I mean, it's, it's, it's documented even outside the Bible. I mean, it, you, you wouldn't have any reason to be there if you didn't follow right along with all that. And there's tradition 
outside the Bible, says that uh, they believe that Terah, Abraham's father, uh, was an idol maker. And that he made the little idols, sort of like if you went to New York City, and on the sidewalks, those little stores, you could go in and buy a little uh, Statue of Liberty, a little trade tower thing. You can take it home with you and put it on glass and a little lamp on the mirror or, you know, on your mantle. I've been to New York. Or a little skyline thing, the kind of uh, trinkets, little moon and stars deal or a little, the God. In fact, it was, uh, I think it was actually two of the gods were Nana and Ningal. I think it's uh, the male and female deities there. So, I mean, they had a whole idolatry thing going there. And the Bible is interesting because it's so silent on this. It doesn't say, how come God spoke to Abraham? And how come he was over there? You know what I mean? It was like God just speaks to someone that we don't even know if he was seeking him or not. And was he saying, there's got to be more than this? Or there's got to, you know what I mean? Well, he spoke to several people and Abraham, Abraham was the only one that responded. Could be. We don't know. That, that's the point. We don't have any other idea. It does say in the Old Testament that the eyes of the Lord search yes. to see yes. anyone seeking me. It does. But right here, this is all it says. So we don't know anything else about, you know, how it transpired, you know, uh, but it did. And he heard him. So in 12.1, uh, the Lord said to Abram, go forth from your country, from your relatives and from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I'll make you a great nation. I'll bless you and make your name great. And so you shall be a blessing. And I will bless those who bless you. And the one who curses you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. This is the beginnings of the, the covenant that God makes with Abram. Ends up changing his name later. But this is huge for the rest of our Bible. And what's fascinating is that you could, you could go over here and, well, okay. In reality... What we're talking about today takes up this. Well, actually, that's not true. Yeah, I guess you got to go all the way back to Gen the beginning, too. This covenant with Abraham covers everything. It covers it all. Our problem is we have taken the covenant at Sinai, the Ten Commandments, and we've said, that is the most important covenant. There are more details in that covenant. I mean, that tells you how to go to the bathroom. And if there's anything I need to know, it's how to go to the bathroom. And I need to know what to eat, what not to eat. I need to know how to handle dead bodies and everything. But you know what right here? It's fascinating that all, all only thing God says is leave your country. <clears throat> he doesn't say you need to do this, you need to do that. You need to start this. You need to start that. You need to stop this and stop that. He says, leave the land. Why? Because there's nothing but idolatry over there. You got to leave that. I mean, your thinking's going to be so messy. You can't stay there. You've got to come out of that. And then he says that, come on, and I'm going to show, I'm going to do all this stuff. So he, he, he lays all this out in verse four. He says, so Abraham left. He went forth as the Lord had spoken to him. And Lot went with him. Abraham was 75 years old when he left Haran because he, now he's getting back on the program because God had already spoken to him in Ur of the Chaldee. They move up to Haran. God wasn't done yet. That's enough. You know, there's more to the story. Come on. So he leaves there. His father dies. He leaves there. Takes all the rest of them with him. And, uh, and look, at, look at verse 5. That explains it more. He took his wife and Lot, his nephew, and all their possessions which they had accumulated and the persons which they had acquired in Haran, and they set out uh, for the land of Canaan. Thus they came to the land of Canaan. And uh, they passed through the land as far as the site of Shechem, uh, and the Canaanite was in the land. And then look at seven. The Lord appears to him again. And to Abraham said, to your descendants, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now look, we got a little issue that's going on right here. And it's something that 
it's going to work on us for the next few chapters. Uh, the Amplified, well, I don't know, read, somebody read the Amplified uh, verse 7, the first part of that verse. Anybody, you got it, Keely? You don't have it. I do. I do. Oh, okay. You got it? Yeah. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I will give this land to your posterity. Okay, to your posterity. Uh, anybody else have anything else? Okay, here's the idea, and this is this is gonna. Oh, to me, this just this gets really interesting. But we have to take a look at this, and one of the reasons why is because the New Testament is just black and white on this. There's there's nothing else. The word there in the Greek is your seed, singular seed. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your seed, I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. The word there is not just descendants, plural, or your posterity is another word. Well, we don't use it much, your posterity, but that's what it means, your descendants, the people who come after you, uh, your bloodline, your family. But something begins to go on with this seed that if the New Testament did not tell us about it, I don't think we'd ever get it. Or if the Holy Spirit didn't reveal it to us. Um, let me, that's, that's almost, because we'll come back to it in a minute. Um, verse 8. It says, Then he proceeded from there to the mount on the east of Bethel, and he pitched his tent, and, he, and built an altar, I'm skipping some of that, and he called on the name of the Lord. So now he's, I mean, he's building a relationship with God. I mean, this is, God is revealing himself to him and they're building a relationship. And now, but look, verse 10, now already a little anxiety begins to happen. It says, now there was a famine in the land. So Abram went down to Egypt <clears throat> to sojourn there where the famine was severe in the land. And it came about when he came near to Egypt that he said to Sarah, his wife, See now, I, I love, the, it's so funny how our interpretations say it sometimes. It's just so boring. How it says, See now, I know that you're a beautiful woman. <clears throat> I mean, you wonder how. They really talk like that? Yeah, yeah, you know what I mean? <laughs> and especially when you're talking about an ancient language or ancient Aramaic or ancient, you know, whatever. How did it come out? And, of course, they may have been more rigid than we are. And probably were in some states. But the point is, she's beautiful. And it, it says this many times in the scripture about Sarah, about Sarah, that she was beautiful. Uh, okay, it just says she was hot. Okay, something like that. Good night. <laughs> and if you notice, she doesn't complain about him no. pawning her off on somebody else either. No? <laughs> she, doesn't, she doesn't complain or drive or anything. Well, and, and, and look, look at verse 12, because he's, he's like, and when the Egyptians see you, they'll say, this is his wife, and they'll kill me, but they'll let you live. So... Please say, verse 13, you're my sister, so that all may go well with me because of you, and that I, that I may live because you're going to do all right. And you'll be able to. <laughs> and, and I believe at the same time, you know what? Uh, because Abram was learning to walk in faith, but I believe at the same time that he probably believed at the same time that God would take care of this. Yeah. You know what I mean? Either so, way, either way was so there. There's a baby faith there, even though it's a it's it's kind of a, a stumbling a little yeah. bit. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah, because yeah. Wait, wait, wait. That's perfect because the idea is still that. Okay, listen. Here, here's here's one of our problems, and it goes. I'm so glad you said that because we think we really have in our mind that God's promises to me are what I'm supposed to do or God's promises are what I'm supposed to help with. They're conditional, not. Yeah. Well, and, and yes, that we, we believe that, but it's still back to the idea that uh, God, for instance, a little bit later when God says uh, you're to have a son, he goes, well, how can we help you with that Lord? Exactly. <laughs> I mean, basically, and it's not just Abraham. 
all of them are in on it. Well, let's see. Let's put our heads together with this thing, you know. <laughs> so the idea is this is this is uh, exactly what you said. That this is Abraham still going. Okay, I got to figure out. There's a famine going on here. We got to eat and listen. Remember what it said. Abraham began to be. Well, remember over here. I'll bless those who bless you. I'll curse those who curse you. Well, before that, I'm going to make a great nation out of you. I'm going to bless you. He was already being blessed. He was already being multiplied, right? So we're not talking about him and Sarai were worried about where they were going to get food. We're talking about his whole entourage, cattle. We're talking about people, servants. I mean, all kinds of people that were already there, their sons and daughters. I mean, you know, and all that. So now it's like, man, we got to we got to sit down and figure out how we're going to do this. <laughs> yeah. There's a famine here. Let's, let's, let's get it on. And so now he's like, okay, now look, if we go in there, they're going to kill me. You know, they're going to say, Hey, she's married. Well, we're not going to bring a married lady into the King's harem, you know, but we'll get rid of Abraham. But anyway, so, uh, but in 17, it's funny because, uh, Oh, well, wait a minute before that verse, 15 she's taken she's seen and she's taken into pharaoh's house and then uh uh it said that in 16 that he treated abram well for her sake gave him sheep oxen and donkey. And so there he's like multiplying him, still multiplying him you know giving him more and uh male and female servants female donkeys and camels i mean all of a sudden he's just sitting there you know and things are getting better by the minute this was holy information thing is working out well. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and then 17, but the Lord struck Pharaoh and his house with great plagues because of Sarah, Abram's wife. And Pharaoh called Abram and said, what is this that you've done to me? Why did you not tell me that she was your wife? And we don't, uh, the only thing that we don't even have understanding exactly how he figure out between the plagues that were struck to him and that, wait a minute, what's going on here? But, um, well, he put it together. The only thing that changed. Well, yeah, evidently he did. <laughs> yeah, so, the only thing. Right. So he said, why did you say she's my sister? So that I took her for my wife. Now, the one verse I showed you up in chapter 20 was when Abraham did this whole routine again. Later. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he did this twice. But, but let's go. Uh, so. In verse 20, Pharaoh commanded his men concerning him, and they escorted him away with his wife and all that belonged to him. Doesn't say anything about taking anything back. It's just like, we want you out of here. Get on out of here. Bless you. So 13, so Abram went up from Egypt to the Negev, and he and his wife and all that belonged to him and Lot with him. And, and I can pretty much tell you basically the rest of this. Uh, hey, look at tw verse 2 in chapter 13. Abram was very rich in livestock, in silver, and in gold. It says extremely here. Oh, yeah. He Big was time. extremely rich. So He was a great... Two chapters. <laughs> a, great, a great shake, you could, or sheik, however you would say it. Uh, I, I've always, a good Arkansas boy would say sheik. So uh, he was... Uh, I mean, wealthy. His tents would be the size of a, maybe even the size of a, a, a small church auditorium. I mean, we're not talking about this building. We're talking about something bigger than that, uh, or at least his dwelling tent. And then they had many, many, many tents that they put up. I mean, it was a, an ordeal. And one of the reasons they probably had to keep moving uh, was because of the grazing lands and stuff. I mean, you, you bring it up. Uh, have you ever seen a field they've had a bunch of goats in? And I mean, right. the grass can be nubbed and there's hardly anything left, you know, but regardless. Um, he, Definitely let's see. Um, my life. Yeah, I thought I heard something good. Someone's talking. Yeah. Is that Shane? Hi, hey, Shane. Hey there, how are you? I'm fine. Can you hear me? Yeah, Great. I just muted you. Good. Okay. <laughs> Didn't know you. Me, sorry. And then stop video and then there we go. You got one more you gotta hide. Okay, gotta do both of them. That's it. 
Okay, it went. You're not full screen. No, I stopped their video. Yeah, they can't. They, you will not see their their screen now. They're still in the meeting. Okay. Okay. Good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good. Uh, actually, I should have uh, scooted this on up too. Where are we at? Twelve seven. Twelve seven. If y'all want to see on there too. Thirteen. Yeah, 13, yeah, 13, too. Okay. Um, oh, how did I get that far? With your scroll wheel? Yeah, you can. There we go. Boy, that's, that's right. Um, and, oh, good, we, we, got, we got some time to move on here. That's good. What happens here, um, let me just kind of tell this part in Chapter 13, that um, Abram and his nephew Lot, both of them are, you know, Lot's family, but also you could you could say his business, his cattle and his people. I mean, they've gotten so big that now both of them are huge together. And then uh, Abram's servants and Lot's servants begin arguing and fighting over everything, the best pasture, the watering and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, Abram says that the land can't sustain us both together. We're too big. We move through, we wipe out everything, you know, that kind of thing. We're just, there's too much. And so, um, and it wasn't really strife between Abraham and Lot or Abram and Lot. I keep calling him Abraham because that's what we hear in the rest of the Bible because uh, God changes his name later. But the idea, um, just if I hadn't said lately, we're in Genesis 13. Uh, and there was, there was something else that I, that I wanted to put on that was that, um, they, that a very, a very real possibility is that when, when God begins, let's, let's see, uh, you'll, you'll see, this is another thing that when, when you read this, uh, in perspective, uh, it's, a, it's a little further on. Let's see, where is it? Okay, uh, it's in chapter 15. We're not there yet. But one of the statements that uh, looking in, looking back, you see that probably why um, he kept hanging with Lot because Abraham had no offspring. He had no sons. He had no children. And the idea was that, okay, back to what Keely was saying, I'll help God out with this because God cannot bless me. Now, now go back and listen to what he said, that uh, I'm going to make a great nation from you. And remember what he said to your seed, your descendants? He didn't have any descendants. So he's thinking, and you'll, you'll see when we get to it in 15. Buzz me later, okay? Okay, buddy. Talk to you later. See you, man. Yes. Bye. He's still thinking. I mean, it's the only thing that seems possible to me, but I mean, but it's, it's no big deal. Just the thought that he's still thinking Lot's going to be my descendant. He's, he's my nephew. So it must be that God will use Lot because I don't have any kids, and I'm getting older every day. You know, so, and, and you'll see what I mean when, I, when we get to chapter 15 about what God speaks to him again. And then he says, wait a minute, I, I, this can't really happen. Because it's, it's, you know what? It's really like the idea when, when God tells us, and we talk about this in our classes and stuff over here too, that you're free and you go, I hear you. <laughs> Now, no. I gotta work the 12 steps. Yeah. It's like, no, listen, I'm telling you, you're free. And you're saying, <laughs> I heard you again. And one of these days, I'm gonna be free. He said, no, I'm telling you, you're free. One day, he I've said, set you free. And you're saying, quick. no, I'm not. I understand what you're saying. I understand where you're going with it. That somehow you're gonna make me free one day. Yeah, when I die, maybe then I'll be free. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> I've set you free. And so it's that same idea that he's telling Abraham all this time, I'm going I'm to make a great nation out of you. And he's going, I ain't got any kids. I'm going to make a great nation out of you. It's going to be your seed, your descendants. 
He goes, well, it's going to be interesting to me how you do it. I'll tell you what, we're going to take Lot, my nephew. Okay, so Lot, you go with me. But what happened was they both got so big with their animals and their servants and everything else that they couldn't, they couldn't stay together, so they, they divided up. And so uh, in uh, 10, uh, verse 10 of chapter 13, that uh, Lot lifted up, he, he told Lot, he said, look, look wherever you want to go, you can go. Uh, and that was kind of cool too, because Abraham left it all in Lot's. He said, you decide where you want to go. So um, Lot lifted up his eyes, I was verse 10, right? And he saw all the valley of the Jordan and it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as you go to Zor. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. And then Abram, verse 12, sat in the land of Canaan. Now that was what God told him in the first place, come to the land of Canaan. So it just, it fit. <laughs> so he comes to Canaan while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. And I might add that, you know what? In those days, if you lived in the country, you probably did real well with, with God and all that. It was the cities where it went nuts. Uh, idol worship, um, all kinds of uh, idolatry and, and everything. I mean, it was just, that's where the parties were. I mean, that, think about it. If you're out there tending the cattle at night, man, your servants are out there watching the flocks and you know, you're, you're close to the land. I mean, probably very similar to today, you know, in, in that sense that once you get out there, you know, it's a whole different world to get out in the country. Uh, but in the, in the town, everything, that's where all the music, that's where all the, you know, everything was going and all the celebrating and, and, and really celebrating wickedness, that, that kind of thing was going on. And so, um, that's where Abram, that's where Lot went to settle. Sodom and Gomorrah. Hey, have y'all ever thought about this? I'm not even real sure about this. But you realize the Dead Sea, isn't that weird that that's in Israel? Do you know how many feet below sea level that place is? I forget what it is. It's way below sea level. Nothing grows in the Dead Sea at all. And, and this, this little statement right here, it said um, in, the, in verse 10, in the valley of the Jordan, and it was well watered everywhere. And then there's a little statement there. As this was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. All the cities around with them. all the salt, and the oh. brine. Very, yeah, very and I wonder about the Dead Sea. I wonder what. Anyway, it's just interesting. Run off from Sodom and Gomorrah. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know how. Hey, that's a lot of salt. Yeah. They say there's so much salt in it that you float. I've heard that too. It's a, I think it's the saltiest body of water on the earth. And I'm, I may be wrong. Does that sound right? Yes. All right, we say it is. Everybody vote for that. It's it's the saltiest. So salty you can't you can't sink in the water. Yeah, you can just lay out in there like it's pretty crazy. Every time I go over there, I'm amazed. I'm saying, have you ever been? No. But if I had been over there, I would have been amazed. How about that? I'm just kidding. So that the Dead Seas and the it's the Jordan Valley. The Jordan River as much water is that over there by? runs into you know the Sea of Galilee. Yes. Sea of Galilee is kind of in the upper part, uh, and it uh, it flow Jordan River flows out of the Sea of Galilee and flows down into the Dead Sea. Oh. So. We went to Grand Acres last weekend, and they had a, uh, they had a, no, it was a satellite photo of the gap and see the gallery. Oh, yeah. Cool. David Dax was teaching on, you know, something, but he, he showed a satellite photo of the sea gallery. Yeah. It's there. That's why, that's why when you said, where's it at? I was like, it's up, because I remember seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. But that, uh, anyway, that was an interesting thought there. So the idea that the um, uh, Lord said to Abram after Lot, this verse 14, after they separated, the Lord tells Abram, he says, lift up your eyes and look 
the place where you are, northward, southward, eastward, and western, for all the land which you see. I will give it to you and to your, anybody know what it says right there? Seed. Seed. Forever. Amplified says descendants. New Mary Sanders says descendants, but in, at least in the margin, they put seed, singular. Who's the seed? Jesus. Anyway, it's interesting. And it says, um, yes, I will give it to your descendants, to your seed forever. Um, I'll make your descendants, your seed, as the dust of the earth, so that anyone can number the dust of the earth, and your descendants can also be numbered. Your seed can also be numbered. It says, Arise, walk about the land through its length and breadth, for I'll give it to you. And then Abram moved his tent and came and dwelt by the oaks of Mamer, Mamer, Marmer, Mamer. Mamre. And in Hebron, he built an altar to the Lord. Now, chapter 14, I, I want to touch on it. There's, this is called, I don't know what, do y'all, do y'all have title on it, Battle of the Kings or the? There's a lot of chapters. Yeah. Abraham rescues Lot. A Abraham rescues Lot. Some, some, I think, my, mine didn't have headings like that, but it's like, um, what happens is these kings came up against each other and the king of Sodom and uh, Gomorrah and some others, uh, they had been paying uh, tribute to these other, uh, verse, four, verse 14, uh, chapter, chapter 14, verse 1 has the guy's name. And in some of the, some versions of the Bible, his name starts with a K and some it starts with C. Chatter Laomer is a, or Canter Laomer <coughs> would be uh, possibilities of it. Yeah. And they were having to pay tribute to him and, and they rebelled. <coughs> they got tired of that. And so they came and defeated those kings, Sodom and Gomorrah, chased them and they captured Lot and his family and men and and then Abraham, somebody came and told Abraham, um, skip down to 13 if you want to, that's kind of where it is. And in 13, a fugitive came and told Abram, the Hebrew, uh, about what was happening. And so he uh, gets some of the folks that are with him, I think the Amorites and uh, these other guys who are allies. And then when Abram, heard that his relative had been taken captive. He let out his trained men, um, born in his house, 318 men. And he went in pursuit. And he divided his forces up against them. And by night, and they defeated them and pursued them as far as Oba, <laughs> which is north of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative, Lot, with his possessions and also the women and the people. And after his return from the defeat of Chedor Laomer is the only way I can figure out Chedor Laomer or Keter, Keter Laomer. Uh, and the kings who were with him, the king of Solomon went out and met him at the valley. And uh, at that same time, here's a kind of an important event that happens. Verse 18. And Melchizedek, Actually, king of Salem, and some versions may say king of Jerusalem, Every Wednesday night. brought out wow. bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he gave him a tenth of all. And the idea was that, that um, Abram paid him a tithe of all that he had taken, uh, the goods that he had taken. And then the king of Sodom said to Abram, give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. 
uh, and Abram said to the king of Solomon, I've sworn to the Lord God most high possessor of heaven and earth. Y'all see where I'm at? Verse 22. That I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours for fear you'd say I've made Abram rich. So he says, I'll take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me. Let them take their share. And so he rescued Lot. I mean, that's, that was the idea. Yeah. And, and brought his family. I, I didn't even read that part, but he brought back uh, all the possessions. This first 16, all the goods and, and his lot with his possessions and also the women and all the people that were with him. But now, you know what? We got time to start this because this is, this is interesting. After all these things, uh, and, and we go back, the reason Melchizedek is interesting is because we know who he is, but we don't know who he is. The New Testament talks about it. Watson. It's a priest that has no beginning and no end. It's like, wait a minute, a priest that has no descendant or has didn't no no ancestors and no descendant. Wait a minute, who is that? Who can that be? And and then Abram pays tithes. You know what is going on with this? You know uh, some pretty interesting stuff going on we'll, we'll talk about it later when we get a little further on but it says verse chapter 15 verse 1 after these things the word of the lord right. came to abram in a vision saying do not fear abram <laughs> and man i thought i had his sound down i'm gonna make sure There we go. <laughs> that was Shane burping. <laughs> Did you hear it? Yes. Yeah. On, on his nice, boat in Florida. <laughs> we heard you burp, Shane. I'll cut it off now. He says, I'm a, sh listen, and this is a, a, a neat saying. Okay, verse one is, do not fear, Abram. I'm a shield to you. Some versions say this, your reward shall be very great. My favorite version is that says, I am your great reward. I love that. Why well, I like either one of them, but I like the idea that God says, I'm your reward. Can't get more than that. Mm -hmm. I am your reward. Fear not. Fear not. I am a shield to you. I am your great reward. Abram says, oh, Lord God. Now, look. He says, I'm your reward, or he says, your reward will be great. Well, to him, now think about this. Abraham has everything he wants. He's got more than enough. He's got everything. So wh why does he make this next statement? Abram says, oh, Lord God, what will you give me? Since I am childless. God had already told him he's going to make him a great nation, make descendants from his descendants and his seed, and he has none. So already you see the thinking that I'm telling you about. He goes, well, how are you going to reward me? He, he, I mean, I already have riches. I already have servants and people and, uh, and cattle and money, and gold and silver. I have everything I need. I mean, way beyond. But God says, I'm going to do more than that. He'd already, and Abram is remembering what he said about making a nation out. He says, what will you give me since I'm childless? And he says, and the heir of my house. See, so look what he says. The heir of my house is actually a slave, Eliezer. He's the only one that he was born in my house. Um, and look, look what he keeps saying, verse 3. And Abram says, since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. That has to be my heir. I, I'm helping you with this, Lord. I'm helping you figure this out. Let him be the heir. Lot's already gone. We, we'd already separated, and now let one in my house be my heir. Then, behold, the word of the Lord came to him in verse 4, saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body, he shall be your heir. And he took him outside and said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you're able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. So he takes him outside, and he looks up, and you can only imagine, I mean, what? Uh, man, probably my neatest experience with this was when I was a kid, but since then, 
you can't hardly see the stars. Just almost anywhere you're at, they're not very good. It used to, you could always see the Milky Way. It seemed like when we were little. But when I went to Fort Davis, Texas, it is unbelievable out there. It's like a show comes on when the sun goes down. I mean, it is incredible, the stars. And here in the Middle East, with no cities of great lights or anything like that, I can only imagine what it looked like when Abram went outside and God says, look up and I'll show you. And so he looks up and he says, count the stars if you're able to count them. And he says, so shall your, what? Seed be, descendants be, seed. And then the scripture says, this is one of the, hey, you know what? If you don't have it underlined, I don't care if it's our Bibles or not, you ought to underline this one because this is probably one of the key scriptures in the entire Bible. Then he believed in the Lord. And in this one it says he reckoned, but he counted it to him. He accredited, um, different versions say it different way. He credited it to him as righteousness right standing with God. He credited it to him as union, you could say. Fellowship with God. Where is this at? That's verse 6. 15, 6. Oh. And he said, to, and then he said to him, I'm the Lord who brought you out of Ur of the Chaldeans to give you, give you this land to possess it. He said, oh Lord God, how may I know that I will possess it? And so he said to him, bring me a three-year-old heifer. Now, what happens here, and we, we, we probably don't have time to go into it. It, it does get exciting. In fact, I'll just read down through it, and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll stop here. He says, bring me a three-year-old heifer and a three-year-old female goat and a three-year-old ram and a turtle dove and a young pigeon. And he brought all these to him and cut them in two and laid each half opposite the other, but he did not cut the bird. And the birds of prey came down upon the carcasses, and Abram drove them away. Now when the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram. And behold, terror and great darkness fell upon him. And, and then now, understand what's happening next. Abraham's asleep. So he's put asleep. So he's seeing it in his sleep. God said to Abram, know for certain that your descendants, your what? Your seed will be strangers in a land that is not theirs, where they will be enslaved and oppressed 400 years. But I will also judge the nation whom they'll serve, and afterward they'll come out with many possessions. As for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You will be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they will return here, for the iniquity of the Amorite is not yet complete. And it came about when the sun had set that it was very dark, and behold, there appeared a smoking oven and a flaming torch which passed between these pieces. 18 is another key verse you might want to underline. 18, on that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram saying, to your seed, I've given this land. From the river of Egypt, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. And then he named some of the people uh, that live in there. Now, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end with that right there. But yes, say something. I mean, they walked the covenant, but Abraham was asleep, so he didn't do anything. He did uh, this Abraham. I mean, but the scripture says that the smoking furnace and the flaming torch or a lamb walked the covenant for him. One of them was God the Father, and the other one was God the Son. Jesus fulfilled Abraham's part of the covenant. Yes. And let's that just, is the most important covenant in the whole Bible, except for the New Testament. Well, and let, let's put it this way: it's 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 fulfilled in the New Covenant. Yeah, I mean, it's brought to brought to fruition. It's brought to completion in the New yeah, Covenant. Yeah, and and we and here's you Jesus, guys. Jesus did the covenant for us. Here's here's the problem. Uh, okay, I, I don't mean to say problem, and I I don't have time to really really get into it today. We'll start with it next week. Because there's a couple of things that we need to do if we're going to understand Israel and if we're going to understand New Covenant people. We need to figure out who this promise was to. 
And I'll give you a hint. It's verse 6. He believed in the Lord and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. And why was Jew or Gentile that is by faith. Apostate Jews that do not believe are not heirs of the promise. They're not. They cannot be. And we have, and part of our problem is, I, I was looking this up today, and even in the Bible software, I was looking it up. And when you look up covenant with Abraham, it just skipped over it. Wow. And it talked about, no, I don't mean completely, but it talked about the covenant of circumcision. But it did not talk about, it did not reference any of the verses, which next week I will do. When you go to Galatians, and Galatians tells you over and over and over in chapter 3 that the seed is Christ. The heirs to the covenant are those who are of faith. And a true son of Abraham in New Testament is someone of faith. Israel when you get the, the law given later, the law is given, and under the law, it says, if you do this and we forget this, you will stay in the land. If you don't do this, you will lose the land. The land was never a free gift. The land was never like, like this was, where God did both parts of it. In the Mosaic Covenant, it was always, if then what I mean is, if you obey me, then you'll be my child. If you won't, I won't be your God. You won't be my child. That's the Mosaic covenant, which should bring us to the Abrahamic covenant. You see what I mean? It brings me to my knees. I can't do it. The curse, see, that's the same chapter in Galatians, the curse of the law. The curse of the law is cursed are you if you don't do everything written in the book of the law. Jesus became the curse for us, took the curse of the law. What? To bring us back, in a sense, to the Abrahamic covenant. Not, not that Jesus then brings us back, but he's the fulfillment of the Abrahamic. You, you know what I mean? So he brings us back to faith. It's only faith. And I miss a crucial misunderstanding of who the promise was. And New Testament tells us, to Abraham and to his seed. Who is his seed? Christ. And of those who have believed and received Christ are like the stars of the sky, the sand on the seashore. We have no idea how many millions of believers there are have been will be no idea far more it did and did this come true with his descendants absolutely in scripture even says that that abraham did become in blood descendants ishmael ishmael went and populated half the middle east and ishmael's uh, descendants and then abraham had other sons and daughters uh, uh, apart from uh, sarah his wife so i mean Yes, and so and, and also through Isaac did did Israel was Israel populated, but not all Israel is Israel, if that makes any sense. Not all Israel is the Israel of faith. Of huh? I said our children of promise. Not all Israel is children of promise. And it's interesting how we've forgotten that. And we don't see what the scripture said on it. I had a, a visit with an older man at, uh, with, uh, at Home Depot with Helena today. It's people that we had met several years ago through there. And all he could talk about was not who we are now or learning to trust God now and everything else. is what's coming. What's coming. What's coming. What's coming. And I thought, wow. I noticed one Do time. you know? You were talking about Ishmael, you know, he was called a child of a slave woman. Yes. Years later, when Joseph was thrown into the cistern, Ishmaelites are the one that took him into Egypt to make slaves of him. So it was actually descendants of his 
of the other bloodline. Of the other bloodline. Yes. Ishmael. Yes. And over there now today, I mean, it it it, it talks about so many. Which was the one that said he'd be Ishmael? He'd be a wild donkey. It said that about Ishmael. It said he'd be kicking against his brother, uh, uh, always uh, fighting on every side. It said uh, all of his borders. It said there would there would constantly be that. But the excitement is, man. I mean, for me, I don't want, I don't want to get hung up on it. But when you begin to see that this promise comes, I mean, it, it's so amazing. And I. I I saw a program on the Bible, uh, and they, the way they were talking about it was so, um, what's the word, medicinal, so mechanical that the Bible is this, and it says it. They didn't mention any of this, I, and and I think it's because it's hidden. This is this is revealed by the Spirit when you realize that. Oh my goodness, this is exactly what Jesus was talking about. Jesus talked about it. He said. Um, you know, a true son of Abraham. Do you remember what he said about Zacchaeus? You remember when he met Zacchaeus in the tree uh, and he called him down and said, I'm going home to eat with you today. And he goes home and he, you know, that Jesus, there's hardly any record of Jesus saying anything to Zacchaeus. It's just, he said, Hey, come down out of the tree. I'm going home and have lunch with you today. And then we have the record of what all happened and what Zacchaeus said and everything else. Jesus didn't say, man, you know, you've been cheating all these people and everything, you know, What's going on there? He didn't say any of that. You go back and read it. It's pretty fascinating. And he said, and what Zach, what happens is Zacchaeus starts going, you know what? I, I've just decided that, you know, I, I've, I've been cheating people for years. I've been taking money away. He said, I'm going to give back people, what, four times as much or twice as much. And anybody I've cheated, I'm going to give back this much more. And I'm going to pay people back and all this. And, and, and uh, then Jesus said, salvation true salvation has come to this house but he said here's what he said here is a true son of abraham what does he mean by that one who's of faith why did he, he was a jew he was a jew why didn't he say here's a son of abraham and now he's got saved he didn't say that he said truly sal what salvation has come to this house today here is a true son of Abraham. And then even when you go back and you say that, um, you remember when the Pharisees came out to John the Baptist and they were wanting to be baptized? Wasn't it Pharisees or it was some, it may not have been Pharisees, but they come out and wanted to be baptized. And John, John the Baptist said, hey, uh, go and show your, your lives or, you know, and then come back and see how you live or something like that. Or, or my, maybe I'm getting my stories mixed up. There was a place where uh, they had made some comments to him about uh, that they were uh, that they were sons of Abraham, and and then maybe that's what it was. And then John Baptist said this: God can raise up these stones to be sons of Abraham, but basically the idea, but a true son of Abraham. See the the idea? There was always a remnant who believed, who believed. And then I read today when Mary, Mary had that song in Luke, if I can't find it real quick, I'm, I'm, I'm still done here. Where would that be? Uh, Luke, maybe? No. Yeah, maybe. Where Mary, the song of Mary, do you know, y'all know what I'm talking about? Um, yeah, it's Luke. I think it's Luke 1. Um, Listen, 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 listen. It says, and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord and my spirit is rejoiced in God my Savior because, because this is what's going to happen to her. And this is when she went and saw Elizabeth. Do you all remember that? Her, um, her cousin. She went and saw her cousin. And her cousin was pregnant with John the Baptist. Do you all remember that? And Mary goes and uh, when she greets the, the baby leaps in her womb. When Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting, the baby leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, then it goes on down to do it, and, and she's saying, blessed is, is, is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what had been spoken to her by the Lord. Now, this is Mary, and Mary said, my soul exalts the Lord. My spirit is rejoiced in God, my Savior, for he has had his regard for this humble state of his bond slave. I mean, he's, why is he thinking about me, you know? And she goes on to every what I, I hate to skip any of it. For the mighty one has done great things for me, and holy is his name. 
and his mercy is upon generation after generation toward those who fear him. He's done mighty deeds with his arm. He's scattered those who are proud in the thoughts of their heart. He's brought down rulers from their thrones and has exalted those who were humble. He has filled the hungry with good things. He's sent away the rich empty-handed. He's given help to Israel, his servant, in remembrance of his mercy. Listen to this. As he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham and his seed forever. She understood. This is the seed. This is the, you see what I mean? And we've discounted some of this and not realized that the promises were to Abraham and to his seed. They would be fulfilled in Christ. Uh, and they say, we don't even understand. What, what's the promise? What was the promise to Abraham? We all say, well, to, he, he, many descendants. The promise to Abraham, and the scripture tells this in the New Testament as well, the promise of the Holy Spirit. That's the promise. Wow. New life. New life.